Changing. All right. Good. Revival. Bible means life. So you're getting life again. Not so much getting saved again, but you're getting life again. You're getting that, okay, a refreshment. And so in, as the revival goes, in Psalm 85, 4, the writer goes, Return to us, God of our salvation, and abandon your displeasure with us. Because a lot of times when revival comes, that means there's impending judgment from God because people have gotten his way from God. And so basically, you have God renewing the church or restoring the church. You know the sub, You know what the subjects of the revival are? The target of revival is us, Christians, who love, who serve the Lord, who say we are Christians, but that's the target. We've, got, we've gotten off base. We've gotten basically uh, sidetracked in different things. And so basically it's bringing us back to our default mode. And y'all got devices you know, I, I have a, a smartphone. And when things get messed up, you have a choice. You can go back to the factory settings. Right? Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not if you are in a set. That, I mean, it just takes you back to square one. You have to do things all over again. But that's what God is doing in revival, is hitting the default setting of the church, bringing us back to where we need to be. Remember Jesus when he went out into the wilderness? Right before he began his ministry. He was tempted by Satan three times. Basically, Satan was trying to get him off track every time. Every time. Hey, turn these stones into bread. Hey, jump off the temple. God will, kick, God will protect you. Hey, you just bow down, worship me. I'll give you everything. And every time Jesus came back with the word of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. You don't tempt God, and then he says, you only worship the Lord your God. Satan's trying to get him sidetracked. Get him off task. How many of y'all do that? You get off task. You get sidetracked. I won't mention any names, but somebody I go to Walmart with. <laughs> we're going down the aisle. We have a buggy that that person is pushing. Okay, we're going to well, I'm in the front of the buggy, and I'm going too, and all of a sudden I look back, and the buggy ain't back there. <laughs> the buggy is off somewhere with the person who is pushing that buggy. They get sidetracked. And so uh, we have a daughter like that. No names. All right, we, we, this is how you get sidetracked. We have a, there's a video of someone they were filming their brain, not, not Emory, but this is, they're another couple, their grandchild, and he's, they're, he's looking, he's in a room, he's talking, he's da 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 squirrel! And he looked out the window and saw a squirrel. That's what happens with us. We get sidetracked. What's the main job of the church? What did Jesus tell us to do? In Matthew, he said in Matthew 28, he said, go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them basically to obey, follow all the things that I've taught you. That's the reason for the church. Go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. And we get off track sometimes, and so that's why we have revival. And the second thing, basically God removes the church, and then God is turning His anger away from the church. Because when we get off track, judgment comes because we're not obeying God obeying what He said. Remember when the children of Israel, they went in, first, first conquered basically in the land. They came up to a city called Jericho. We can't do this. God says, all right, here's your plans. March around one time. Second, you know, all you're doing is marching. And then the last day, march around seven times, blow the trumpet, yell, and this is what's going to happen. The walls came down. Boom. They said, wow, this is great. Didn't lose a person. Didn't have to draw a sword. That's just it. Done. And so God took care of it. Now, but God said, don't pick up anything. Just, just leave it. Go pick it up. And so then they go to this little old town called Ai. Nah, that's nothing. So they picked out a few guys and they said, go just go take it. They got their behinds whooped. Their people got killed. Why? Uh, they came back. Oh, God, please, please. Oh, what are we doing? Jericho fell. <laughs> this little old town, what are we going to do? And God said, Joshua, get up. 
Get off your knees. And here's what's happening. Somebody sinned. And you got to find out. So they eventually, it came down to, they found this guy named Homer. Aiken, right? He had taken some things, buried it under his tent. And because he had done that, they lost sin. And so God's judgment. So God, the focus is us. God's judgment is coming. So we have revival. We want to come back to Him. Remember I said last week, there's a guy that studies revival. He says that our nation, the nation of the United States of America, on a scale of 1 to 10, as far as judgment and things going on, 1 being everything's great, 10 being judgment's falling, this guy said, in my opinion, we're at 9.5. 9.5. He says, so we better be careful. We better be aware. And then, basically, God manifesting Himself to His people. The focus is us restoring the church, God turning His anger away from the church, and God manifesting Himself to His people. God becomes more real to us. You say, what? I already believe God's real. Mm -hmm. You do. But how real is God to you? This is when God comes and visits. He has an outpouring of Himself. And you know that the presence of God is here. Moses, he had the presence of God. He met God face to face. And when he came out, they said, Moses, cover your face, man. It's too bright. Can't cover it. Can't up. Can't look on your face because the glory of God was reflecting on. Solomon, when they dedicated the temple, the glory of God came down in a the cloud. They couldn't even go in because God's presence was so overwhelming. In Acts chapter 2, the people were praying in the upper room. Sound like a wind coming in. Fire on top of their heads. Holy Spirit came. That's the presence of God. Basically, what happened? We have a deep awareness of God's presence. We can't escape his eye. He's everywhere. He sees everything. We don't, we, but we have that awareness. Spiritual things become overwhelmingly real to us. Instead of just, ah, okay, but they become real. The truth of God's word becomes just so overwhelmingly powerful to us. This book, the Bible, is a lie. It's a living book. And it affects us. If you read it and follow it, it will affect you. And then Christians become fearless in their witness, tireless in their service. This is when a revival occurs. And then basically, the manifesting of God's gracious presence wakens us, gets us out of our sleep. And y'all take a nap? I like to take naps. That's how you become a, a good missionary. You take naps. Y'all didn't know that, did you? You take naps. You get refreshed. Well, basically, but you got to wake up eventually out of that nap. And so basically, God is awaking us out of our sleep. We can be lulled to sleep. December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor. Some of y'all remember that. Pearl Harbor. This is Oroku Yamamoto, commander in the Japanese Army. He said this after Pearl Harbor. I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. That's what he knew that happened when he attacked the United States. He said, I'm afraid. He said, this is what we've done. Awaken the terrible giant who has been filled with resolve to fight. And you know the outcome of all of that. But the thing is, Satan wants the church to be asleep. Sometimes he doesn't have to persecute the church. He doesn't have to do these things. He'll just lull you to sleep. I mean, y'all sing lullabies to your kids, sing the songs, and they go to sleep. And maybe y'all sing to each other and y'all go to sleep. And maybe y'all you're singing would keep everybody up. And you, you would pay them, please stop singing. But the thing is, Satan, Satan is not afraid of a church that's asleep. They're not doing anything. I don't have to worry about it. He's afraid of the church that's on their knees in prayer and serving God. And, we, and when we get God's presence in our lives and it becomes more real, that's what he's afraid of. Is a church that's on their knees and on their feet serving. So that's real revival. And basically, we have that. It energizes us to serve in ways that we never thought before. And then God, what's another point of revival? God makes his 
the sovereignty of His grace known. We realize that revival, I know I've been to revival meetings and things, and a lot of times you get caught up in the emotions and the people. But God is showing it's by His sovereign grace that He gives revival. No schemes of men, no anything that we can drum up. It's God's sovereign grace. Human plans had nothing to do with it. It's God's sovereign grace. So, if we have revival, what do we do? First, if you want revival, the work has to start in yourself. Thank you. It has to start in yourself, in me. You know the song, Lord, send a revival? Lord, send a revival. Lord, send a revival. And let it begin in me. In me. That's where it starts. And it directly applies to us. Remember the, the church in Laodicea? <laughs> no, y'all don't remember, of course. But you read, remember reading about it in Revelation. And that's the church when he said, Hey, you know, you guys are rich. You have all these advantages, all these things. But the problem is, you aren't hot. You aren't cold. You're lukewarm. And what do you do with lukewarm? Spit it out. Spit it out. That's right. And Jesus said, that's where you are, ladies and gentlemen. You are lukewarm. So, spit it out. He said, that's what I want to do is spit you out. Because he said, this is what you need to do. And he gives them, hey, this is what you need to do. You need to come to me. You need to do this. So, let the revival begin in me. And it's personal. Are you hot, cold, lukewarm? Where are you? I don't know, but where are you? And basically what happens, you get more serious about different things. You're honest with each other. You get serious about worship and about witnessing, prayer, praise, meditation, giving, petition. David wrote in Psalm 139 about real revival. He said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. And see if there's any offensive or wicked way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. Search me, God. In other words, change me, God. And use me, God. And then after basically starting in you, it works. Now, come on, I'll get it out. It applies to you. You're more serious about the things of God. And then you trust the Holy Spirit to work from there. And He is. But, you know, some people say, ah, oh, you know, I like things the way they are. I, I'm okay. And what do we say? Just okay is not okay. You seen those commercials? You know, and remember what Matt Smithers, Smith first said? He said the most common way to reject Jesus, to put off these things, to not even pay attention, it's not with a defiant curse, but it is with a disinterested shrug. Whatever. Whatever. I don't care. You know, I've got my own life to live. I've got things to do. God, I don't care about you. Whatever. You have to be aware of what's going on if we want real revival. We want to really see God work in us. It applies to us. Many people in the U.S. no longer regularly attend church services, attending church services. Several reasons some believe God did not play an important part in everyday life. God is also supposed, supposedly unconcerned with a person's church attendance. Rather, God will judge the person on how he or she has lived this life on earth. Other people have become too consumed with earning a living to have time to worship God. As a result, declining religious convictions, many religious faiths are beginning to decline. That's today, isn't it? That was written about the late 1700s in the United States. They had the, the First Great Awakening, Revolutionary War and all those things. Church attendance declining. People really didn't care. Didn't think that God really cared about their daily lives. And so what was happening is they saw some revival start to come meetings. Uh, it started out in, in Europe, in uh, Scotland, in Wales, in Great Britain. You had what they called holy fairs. And you know what they call them here? Camp meetings. Yeah, camp meetings. They meet outside somewhere. They have camp meetings. And basically, the people in that time, they encouraged people to return to God. 
Many were convinced to be more actively dedicated their lives to God and to live in a godly manner. Church attendance started to increase during the first half of the 19th century. And you saw things that began to happen as it called the Second Great Awakening in the United States. John Dome, D-O-N-N-E. How many of y'all remember him from your English literature class? D-O-N-N-E. I see all of y'all paid attention. <laughs> he wrote sonnets and poems and different things. But he wrote, wrote one that's called Holy Sonnet Number 14. Don't you just love those titles? Sounds like Jaws 31 or something, you know? <laughs> Holy Sonnet Number 14. Now, I won't read you the whole thing. Whew, thank you. I just read you the first four lines. Now, you've got to understand, when he was writing this, he lived from 1571 to 1631, so he's basically Shakespearean English. All right? Y'all remember that? Y'all still speak Shakespearean English? Thus, they also speak in the Shakespearean English. <laughs> no, you know. All right, this is what he wrote. He said, batter, B-A-T-T-E-R, batter my heart, three person to God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to men, that I may rise and stand, overthrow me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I'm going to read you the rest of it. Basically, those first four lines give you the thing. He says, God, basically, break me, melt me, mold me, move me. As Karen was playing, I am in the potter's hands. And that's what he was saying. God, you take me in your hands and you do what's necessary to make me what I need to be. Now, don't reject these things. Don't push God away. Don't just say, ah, you know, don't give the shrug of the shoulder. I was talking with Jay today and we were talking about this fun coronavirus. That's another flu. I said, Jay, I said, what do you think about all this? You hear this stuff? And I said, what do you think about it? She says, just stay away from me. <laughs> I said, Jay, you sung it. I like it. Just stay away from me. But don't do that with God. Some people, eh, I don't care what God says, and they say, just stay away from me tomorrow. But you don't want that. Because if God stays away from you, there's going to be some problems. Strive. Seek God. He wants to be here. He wants to be in your life. He wants us to serve Him in the right way. Let's bow our heads. I hope you're not telling God, just stay away from me. We don't want that. What we do want is God to meet with us, to be here, to sense His presence. And when He does that, He'll help us to hit that reset button, to be what we ought to be. Not just a shrug and say, oh well, but God, please work in my life. Has he done that? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? If you don't, it's not hard. You recognize who Jesus is, the Son of God, who died for us on the cross to save us from our sins. You say, God, I am a sinner. I've sinned. I can't do anything for myself. I accept you as my Lord and Savior, and I am trusting you for salvation, for eternal life. That's all you have to do. There's no set prayer you have to pray. You just have to mean it. And maybe you've done that. Maybe you like to follow God in baptism. Basically, baptism is just a testimony to other people. This is what I've done. Or, where are you in your relationship to the Lord? Do you need to hit the reset button? Does God? You don't want God to hit the reset button. Because He will. But it'd be better if you hit it first and come back yourself. Where are you today? I'll be right down here if you'd like to come and talk to me about any of these things, about accepting Jesus Christ, about baptism. I'll talk with you after church, whatever you would like to do. I'm here.
and other people are here as well. But Karen's going to play one verse of a song if you'd like to come. You don't have to, but if you'd like to come, I'm right here. And then just do business with God right there. What do you need to do? Thank you. 